Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal agriculture. Tonight, we're taking on another big topic in the global swine industry and continuing a conversation started during one of our Real Science Lecture Series webinars. African swine fever virus has recently been reported in Thailand and continues to spread around the globe. As North America braces for any sign of ASD and continues to struggle with other lipid uh, envelope viruses such as PERS and PEDV, we all look for ways to mitigate the impact. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts at the Real Science Exchange. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Charlie Elrod from Natural Biologics. Charlie is an adjunct associate professor with Cornell University and president of Natural Biologics. Uh, welcome to the exchange, Charlie. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be here. Well, it's good to have you here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Natural Biologics and then introduce your guest and uh, that you brought to the pub tonight? Sure. So... Um... Natural Biologics is a company I founded. It's coming on about seven years old. Uh, we were founded basically as an animal health company, but wanting to tap into the power of natural compounds that are biologically active and can uh, bring with them specific modes of action or activity. Uh, perhaps it's antimicrobial, antiviral, uh, immune enhancing or whatever and then combine those into products which address the specific challenges faced by typically livestock or production animals. So, uh, you know, we use a number of compounds from all around the world, naturally sourced, and, and really, uh, again, put those to work to support, uh, you know, basically lower the level of challenge to the animals and then also re uh, increase their capacity to respond to a disease challenge. Uh, we, we work really hard to, to validate these uh, compounds and understand their modes of action and, uh, you know, then, then publish our work and get it out there for the world to see so that, uh, you know, we have the credibility to bring these solutions to market. We also try to engage with the world's top experts in, in given fields to tap into the best expertise to either help us validate or communicate or even uh, explore new areas that we may not be as familiar with. And it's along those lines that I uh, became associated with Dr. Josh Jackman several years ago. And initially, uh, I, I reached out to Josh. Uh, I was on the planning committee for one of the Discover conferences on natural bioactives. And I had recently read a review of Josh's in which he was looking at medium chain fatty acids and monoglycerides as antimicrobial uh, compounds. And I thought it would be really interesting to bring to that natural bioactives conference this perspective on bioactive lipids and how they might be uh, you know, useful in, in deploying in, in livestock agriculture. Uh, unfortunately for the conference, uh, Josh was just even in that month uh, leaving the US and taking up a faculty position at Sung Kyung Kwan University in Korea. So he wouldn't be able to join us for the, um, for the conference, but uh, we, we struck up a friendship and a collaboration. He has since uh, been a, a consultant of ours and has more recently joined our board of directors uh, as an important scientific advisor. And, and so we've enjoyed a, a wide ranging uh, relationship over the last uh, four years, I think it has been Josh. And uh, you know we, we've had a lot of fun, explored a lot of different areas together. Uh, Josh's background is largely in human fields. He's uh, studied gastroenterology, uh, chemical engineering, uh, biophysics, all kinds of different fields. Uh, in fact, Josh holds a couple of patents for antiviral peptides against, against Zika and dengue viruses. So, and has has spun those off into into commercial commercialization. So we're real lucky to, to kind of drag him into agriculture and, and help him uh, address some of the challenges facing livestock, and in particular, these viruses that uh, are affecting pigs all around the world. And with that, I would turn it back over to Josh uh, if you want to fill in 
any of the gaps, which I only covered the the thirty thousand foot view of. Yeah, first of all, thanks Scott and Charlie for you know inviting me to join today. And you know, one thing that's kind of funny, you know, a, a physical on site meeting that got kind of you know I wasn't able to attend um, a couple years ago turned into four years of virtual collaboration now with COVID and everything. Uh, so you know, it's been really kind of a uh, ironic twist, but you know, we really had a lot of great fun over the last couple years. I'm um, doing really great science. Um, really combining disciplines that normally people don't think about, you know, combining, you know, uh, things like chemical engineering and physics and different type of sensors with, you know, agriculture, livestock production. And really, you know, it, it's been a kind of a creative, uh, fun journey. And I think it's just, um, you know, really just beginning there. There's so much more, um, you know, ahead of us. Um, but, you know, a lot of great questions are, you know, coming up every day when we kind of find the answer to one question, 10 new questions emerge. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of a journey. And I, I think it's really, you know, been quite fun to kind of, you know, go this way. So I'm really happy you know, Charlie uh, reached out to me. Uh, it was really probably the least expected email I've gotten in a long time. And it opened a whole new world to me. Uh, well, Josh, we're really looking forward to the conversation tonight. Uh, you bring, you're going to bring quite a bit to the party. Uh, tonight, my co-host is Dr. Ken Sanderson. Ken is a veterinarian and I'm sure uh, has a great interest uh, in the on-farm application of these new technologies you guys have been researching. Uh, Ken, you've joined us here a couple times before at the uh, uh, Real Science Exchange, and so I look forward to your uh, veterinary perspective. Thanks. Um, to get us started here tonight, Charlie, can you tell us uh, how you got started down the path of looking at uh, lipid envelope viruses? Yeah, so it's it's probably been five years ago or so that um, you know we we started out as largely a ruminant focused company, but I knew we didn't want to keep all our eggs in that basket. And at the time, as I talked to some of my friends in the swine industry. Uh, PED had recently swept through the, the North America and the U.S. Um, PERS was a, a consistent and, and annual problem for uh, swine producers across the country, you know, costing, you know, over half a billion dollars in, in losses every year. And so I just wanted to, to kind of reach out and, and try and find some new technologies in a new species so that it, you know, broadened our our product development uh, pipeline, but also broadened our species um, interest uh, just in a, in a matter of diversification. So I, I saw some anecdotal data out of Europe about the use of glycerol monolaurate uh, in combating uh, PERS infections, or, or rather in preventing PERS infections. And so based on you know those few reports, uh, I started digging into the scientific literature, and there was, you know, a pretty good body of evidence that um, these monoglycerides and and medium chain fatty acids could be antimicrobial, um, and some evidence of their being antiviral against some specific viruses. Uh, vesicular stomatitis viruses is, is one that um, I came up with, or or rather was, you know, I found in the literature. But then where the most work had been done was actually to be found in the um, human AIDS related research literature. So human immunodeficiency virus research literature. And there were a couple of papers, several papers, one of which was in Nature, which described how transmission of AIDS could be prevented with the application, topical application of glycerol monolaurate. And so digging into that some, uh, you know, I, I just I came to understand that, you know, uh, this monoglyceride has a number of very interesting uh, properties. It's antimicrobial, as I've said. It was also antiviral against the HIV virus, and it was also anti-inflammatory. And so these authors in that Nature paper hypothesized that part of the way that uh, GML could prevent AIDS transmission was uh, up, upon exposure of an epithelial tissue to the virus, it would typically raise an inflammatory response. And that re inflammatory response in turn, you know, recruited macrophages to the site of the infection to help fight the infection as they're, as they're supposed to do. 
in a in a typical infection though those macrophages are actually the target for the virus and once the virus enters those macrophages then it begins replicating and those macrophages circulate throughout the body and spewing virus as they go <clears throat> excuse me um so if the gml tamps down that initial inflammatory response it it precludes the recruitment of macrophages or certainly reduces the recruitment of macrophages so they don't then become infected and go spread around the body at the same time the gml is antiviral so it's actually reducing the viral load there at the site of infection at the same time, it's leading to these anti-inflammatory activities. And so in essence, what they found, and this was done in a, a monkey model, so it was actually the simian immunodeficiency virus, not human, um, but they found that it could practically eliminate the transmission of AIDS, but again, through a topical application of GML you know, at the site of, of the infection or transmission. So, and it was, I think five years ago, I, I made a presentation to the veterinary and nutritionist groups for uh, a large integrator where I had some contacts. And I thought this might last half an hour because pretty much most of the data I had to share, it was that anecdotal or, or kind of small field study data from Europe. Most of the rest of it was, uh, you know, age related data, but kind of showing proof of concept that with a lipid enveloped virus, maybe this could be effective against PERS. And, uh, you know, they listened respectfully. And, it, you know, actually the call went on for about two hours because there was great conversation around it. But we took it from there and just began kind of chipping away at the different pieces of that story to see if we could build the, the monoglyceride antiviral anti-inflammatory story until we had a pretty comprehensive portfolio, if you will, of data to support its use in this kind of application. Just kind of a point of clarification. So uh, being antiviral, is it against all viruses or only the lipid encapsulated or, or enveloped viruses? Yeah, it, at this point, and, and Josh, please chime in. At this point, we, we believe it to be primarily against the lipid enveloped yeah. viruses. So that would include PED, PERS, um, African swine fever, uh, some of the uh, poultry viruses, perhaps, you know, coronavirus, uh, rotavirus, too, that afflict calves. Um, you know, there could be applications there, too. Oh, so Sorry, I was just going to ask real quick. Uh, is there a, oh, sense, yeah? Uh, yeah. Uh, a sense of what percent of the viruses, uh, economically um, uh, important viruses, are uh, lipid enveloped? It sounds you know, like a lot of them. Josh actually published another review just a year ago, right? Yeah, that's actually oh. what I was going to bring up. Scott, oh, your question sorry. is really perfect. No, 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 no. perfect. Uh, Charlie, do you want to go first? I mean, just well, I, I was there? just going to say that uh -huh. in this review, Josh points out that most of the great human pandemics of the last hundred years, I think you, you documented, almost all of those were caused by lipid enveloped viruses. I'll let you elaborate, Josh. Yeah, no, Scott, your question's a really, really good one. Because one thing, you know, this field of kind of targeting lipid envelope and the viruses, uh, we've been doing it for human applications even. Um, myself from about 2008, 2010 range, um, researchers in general, maybe two, three decades. But always one question comes up, you know, oh, what? A, well, you can stop some of the viruses, but there's non-enveloped viruses too that don't have this envelope. What about them, for example? And, mm -hmm. and the thing is uh, about a year, year and a half ago, we, we started thinking about, okay, there's non-enveloped viruses, there's these lipid envelope viruses. Actually, you know, how important are these two groups? No one actually really you know, thought about it. So what we did is we looked at kind of what were the, uh, all the epidemics, pandemics over the last 10 years, uh, how many have been caused by lipid envelope viruses, how many have been caused by non-enveloped viruses? And, and what we saw is that about over 80% and all the big ones have been caused by lipid enveloped viruses uh, for human populations. And also even for animal populations, all have been caused by lipid enveloped viruses too. So we just saw that there's huge economic significance, huge um, significance in terms of what's actually affecting people, what's affecting livestock um, with these lipid enveloped viruses. It's not to say non-enveloped viruses are, are not important, but 
but really when it comes to outbreaks, uh, pandemics, epidemics, uh, nearly everything's uh, been caused by uh, lipid envelope viruses. So huge significance in, in this. And, you know, this is really where, you know, meeting Charlie a couple years ago, really right before COVID-19, you know, a year or two before, it was really a fortuitous timing in terms of really taking this technology, what's been developed for human populations for a long time, um, combining it with, you know, Charlie's scientific curiosity and really kind of merging the, the human and, and livestock challenges of viruses um, and really, you know, building a research program uh, that can potentially address, you know, all these different types of lipid envelope viruses of really huge uh, economic uh, importance, as you mentioned. Yeah, can you guys kind of give us an overview of some of the research that you've done with the uh, uh, GML to date? And, and what are some of the key findings and maybe some of the application that you might have uh, discovered? Yeah, so, um, you know, as I said, we, we started out with a, a search more oriented towards PERS because it was the most prevalent uh, challenge facing swine producers at the time. Uh, we made a few stabs at, at determining whether uh, GML was antiviral. We didn't didn't have the um, protocols down right, and uh, so. But then ASF burst onto the scene, and and by that time, Josh and I had been working together six or eight months or so, and um, so you know. Josh, doing his due diligence, uh, came across this lab in Armenia that had been publishing on ASF for about a decade because they had had basically endemic ASF circulating in their swine population for that length of time. This group was, it was the Antiviral Defense Group, which is part of the Institute of Molecular Biology at the National Academy of Science in Armenia. So the head of that antiviral defense group, Hovakim Zakarian, uh, we basically emailed him, set up a call, and uh, established uh, a collaboration. And so we've done a, a number of studies uh, with him, both with the medium chain fatty acids and monoglycerides, but also then subsequently with some other classes of compounds. And so we kind of started out at the time, there was a, a whole lot of... Um, you know, publicity and, and awareness of medium chain fatty acids as potential uh, feed mitigants. And so we, we started with that, just a, you know, simple in vitro assays, looking at individual medium chain fatty acids and some of the monoglycerides to determine whether they were virucidal. And then if they also had additional um, effects, which would prevent viral replication. And I, I try to distinguish those because they're kind of two different levels of activity. So virucidal would be directly inactivating the virus, whereas then what we call antiviral could include, you know, inactivation of the virus, or it could include some other disruption of that either viral entry attachment or entry uh, unpacking, uh, replication, rebundling, and then exocytosis from the host cell. So any of those steps are prone to disruption, but uh, we've kind of lumped them into, you know, the virucidal and the antiviral as two different kind of buckets, if you will. So uh, we found that uh, at, I'll, I'll say fairly high concentrations, five millimolar, uh, all of the medium chain fatty acids and GML that we tested had roughly similar virucidal, so direct inactivation of the virus um, activity. So 1.1 to 1.7 log reductions in the amount of infective ASF virus. Okay, when we tested lower concentrations of the fatty acids and GML, so about 20 times lower concentration, we found that only GML had that virucidal activity. So the medium chain fatty acids did not, and, and GML did. So, and then, you know, the, the work that Josh has done in terms of these compounds and their interactions with membranes on, you know, in vitro supported lipid bilayers is the system he uses. Um, 
that there are certain physical characteristics which would, in essence, dictate why or why not these different compounds would have the effects that they do. And Josh, you want to elaborate on that? Um, you know, why are the MCFAs here and, and GML there in terms of yeah. efficacy? Yeah, no, it's a great question and point. So, you know, one thing with these biology assays when you study ASF or a lot of these viruses, you know, they, they take time, they require a lot of safety requirements, a lot of really high level of technical expertise. And, and you're mainly looking at the output, like does it kill a virus, does it not? But what we do in, in our research group and one of the collaborations we do with Charlie too is really from more of a kind of engineering chemistry perspective, understanding you know why these compounds not work. Not only do they kill a virus, but why do they kill a virus? You know, how can we compare? How do we judge why MCFA or GML are better or worse for a certain application or comparatively, how do they work? Uh, so what we've done is actually develop more simplified um, experimental tools uh, where we mimic a kind of viral membrane, um, but using uh, safe materials that we can use in any lab. You know, I, I'm in my, my parents' house in Florida visiting now. I could do the experiment here, you know, for example. You know, it's quite safe. I don't need to be in some special laboratory, you know, in the middle of nowhere, you know, in a real high secure facility. No, I can do it anywhere. So it really increases accessibility. Um, but the really powerful thing is that we can actually look at the interactions themselves. Not only if something happens, the effect, but we can look at the cause. So we can understand why a compound works, why one maybe work at 10 times lower dose than another compound. Uh, we can really understand the basic principles using these kind of model membranes, we call them, kind of virus mimicking platforms. And we can really have a lot of different type of scientific uh, measurement techniques that we can study these process in very detailed manner. Um, for a long time, actually, you know, people have done these kind of studies uh, in various contexts, usually fundamental kind of chemistry labs. But one thing really cool about this ASF work um, is that we actually saw for the first time a really a direct connection between these laboratory results, what we call kind of biophysical chemistry studies, and actually the the implications for antiviral activity in ASF. Uh, we saw kind of a perfect correlation between how a compound would work uh, in terms of antiviral activity against ASF um, versus the concentrations we predicted we would, would work um, from the past 10 years of engineering research. Um, so really, it's been really a helpful um, approach to kind of complement the biological studies and, and really build a, a better understanding of what's going on, uh, not only for fundamental understanding, but also for the application. Uh, because we can understand, okay, if we take this compound, how we're probably working against ASF or PERS or PEDV, uh, which one's the best to pick? How can we maybe take two compounds and make them work better together than one compound alone? Uh, so it really gives us a lot of kind of chemical knowledge um, that we can use for practical purposes. So the ability really, Josh, I, I, th I think maybe part of the reward for you has been that translational step that, yeah, that takes it from, you know, you've been in the lab and, and doing all this great work and, and, you know, as so many graduate students do, it, at some point they're going to ask, what do I do with this? What's yeah, exactly. I, I've this? been able to incentivize my students with meaning much better. So my students are much happier <laughs> overall. <laughs> So, so Charlie uh, and Josh, you talked about um, tamping down the inflammatory response, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to understand how you reconciled what I'll call the membrane activity versus the opposite. If well, I guess it's not really an opposite, but this almost contradictory aspect of tamping down the inflammation aspect and. And I'm curious about the mechanism that that allow for the macrophages to not participate, as it were, with the dissemination. Yeah. And and Ken, if I can't answer that completely, it's because I haven't read that nature paper here in the last few weeks to, to understand. But um so so in, in that nature paper, they basically used cultured uh, human vaginal epithelial cells, and then they looked at uh, inflammatory cytokine expression, MIP3 alpha and, and others, um, and basically showed that uh, they could in vitro 
reduce the level of those inflammatory cytokines in the face of an exposure to this virus. Okay, I think then in this in the monkey model of uh, of infection and preventing transmission, they did actually do some tissue measurements of macrophage infiltration, and and you as a veterinarian would know better than I how one might do that. Um, but you know they could. My recollection of it is that they they could actually measure the recruitment of macrophages and infiltration and inflammation into that tissue, into the vaginal tissue where they were applying the treatments, uh, both the GML as well as the, the virus exposure. We wanted to follow that through and just, in a sense, update and validate it in a different system to see if we got a similar type of response. So we worked with uh, Barry Bradford and one of his graduate students, Sarah Savinsky, uh, when Barry was at K-State. And they had developed a murine uh, cell model that basically measured the, the expression of NF-kappa beta, which is kind of a master signaling uh, cytokine that kind of sits on top of the whole inflammatory chain in response to some stimulus, in this case, LPS exposure. And, and so what we were actually testing not only glycerol monolaurate, but also straight lauric acid and the methyl ester of lauric acid. And we saw a very nice dose-wise um, reduction in the uh, expression of NF-kappa beta, you know, in response to LPS. So the more lauric acid or its analogs that were in the system, the lower the expression of NF kappa beta. So that may be part of your question. I think the other part is how do you kind of balance the the need for that macrophage recruitment and fighting the infection versus keeping them away? And I, I think it's it, it's probably some kind of biological balance act that that is not totally within our control, certainly. So you know, tamping it down some. Uh, also reducing the viral load at the end of the day, if that results in fewer macrophages getting infected and fewer virus particles surviving in that mucosal environment, you know, whether it's nasal, oral, wherever, um, then you've, you've improved the chances of that host animal. It's kind of kind of a mass balance type of... Uh, yeah, and it's a really interesting... Uh, concept. <clears throat> I guess I'm kind of curious. Were, were you actually able to align in some kind of quantitative manner the macrophage activity or tamping it down against the I'm going to call it the whole punching technique um, within the viral membrane, <clears throat> so that you had this endpoint that was balanced, or was that? Is that almost, and does that depend on which uh, fatty acid you're using? Yeah, so we, we have not done the in vivo studies to, in a sense, replicate that work from the Nature paper with a SIV. Um, that would be interesting. We have, uh, through, for instance, um, this Pipestone challenge with the uh, PERS virus, you know, the, the GML was fed at a level that allowed the treated pigs to maintain normal growth rates, uh, maintain normal uh, you know, mortality, morbidity, um, but also not have any, well, very few uh, positive oral swabs, no seroconversion, um, and, and no clinical signs of disease. So at that kind of a level and an admittedly crude kind of um, study in the grand scheme of things, it, it was effective. So I'm not sure that we'll ever need to get to kind of the, the, the pharmacological level of, okay, we want, we want a 10% reduction in macrophages and we want a 90% reduction in, in virus load. And, and then we'll, we've kind of tuned the perfect balance for maintaining health and, and, and 
responsiveness to other challenges. Because mm-hmm. at the same time that, you know, there's that potential exposure to PERS or PED, they're also affected with, you know, bacterial respiratory challenges and, and whatever else. So, you know, you don't want to completely tamp, tamp down the, uh, the inflammatory or innate immune response. Right. No, that's, that's a great answer. I, <clears throat> I was wondering about whether there was a uh, spillover effect, uh, in inadvertent depression, if you like, against other things that the animals are going to be exposed to. Yeah. You, I mean, like anything, too much of anything can, can be a bad thing. Um, so yeah, I think we certainly could, um, GML has actually been used in Australia at higher levels. And, and Josh, you may remember, I think it's when they get to the one to one and a half or 2% of the feed, they can actually reduce feed intake and and therefore therefore retard maturation in the finishing phase so that they can delay delivery to market say market timing isn't right or feed supplies isn't right or whatever and they need to to slow some animals down uh gml i believe the author was plosky um a researcher in australia has done a lot of work on that in terms of kind of timing uh pigs and using gml as a almost uh, uh, to, to reduce feed intake and just slow them down. So it certainly has that capability. I, I have one more question if Scott will let me, but the, um, I don't know if I'm thinking about this in far too simplistic, I'm sure I am manner, but is one hole in the lipid membrane, to phrase it this way, sufficient or do you have to create multiple areas of damage to the lipid membrane and to what extent does that change the i'll call it exposure slash dose or duration of exposure does that question make sense oh it makes a lot of sense it's not a simplistic question it's an excellent question the uh you know this is really actually tie in a lot with uh, researchers generally when they study membrane active compounds to inhibit pathogens a lot of people looked in in terms of bacterial pathogens and in, 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 uh, historically and, and with bacterial pathogens you can actually imagine one hole in the bacterial cell membrane would be enough to really disrupt a lot of things going on bacterial cell is actually living uh, it needs to have you know, ion gradients uh, concentration gradients across this membrane and so forth so, so theoretically one hole in a bacteria can cause a lot of damage. Um, When you go to viruses, um, they're quite different. So actually, um, at least in in related research for other types of compounds like antiviral peptides, which make holes in in, um, viral membranes, uh, what we've seen is one hole is not enough. So actually, you need to make a critical density of holes in this virus membrane in order to call, cause it to kind of collapse. So our, our working model of this, um, and that was for peptides, but we, we generalize it a bit just conceptually. Um, but but it, it seems that in general, more than one hole is necessary for a virus membrane to become uh, inactive or in, in, uh, in broken down. And, and we, we think that that structural damage is really important, not just poking a hole um, to damage, like or to affect concentration gradients and so forth, like with bacterial cells, but but really pretty significantly damaging it um, to really, you know, break the stru- structural integrity of the virus particle. So I'd say multiple holes. Now, the one flip side is that th- th- there's a there's caveat to this, that it doesn't seem that it's necessary to actually totally break the virus particle to actually stop it from um, causing infection. So the the thing is, usually when virus particles actually uh, infect a cell, what they do is they need to actually uh, fuse with the cell, which means that the human cell or the animal cell uh, membrane and this virus particle membrane, they kind of fuse together. And and this is a kind of dynamic process where shapes are changing and things need to kind of uh, merge together. And we call this fusion. So actually, sometimes before you actually start really damaging the membrane and making it like Swiss cheese, um, you can actually, some, we think that these compounds at little bit lower doses um, can already start preventing the viral membranes from fusing with cellular membranes so we can prevent infection. So there's some, depending on the exact compound, 
uh, depending on the exact environment conditions, uh, we think that you can have at least two kind of modes of action that are kind of related, but a little bit nuanced. One is kind of preventing the virus from actually fusing with cell membranes, uh, where, where maybe it doesn't make a hole per se, but it, it kind of, this compound might kind of wedge itself into this virus membrane and kind of change the properties of this virus membrane. Um, and there's been a lot of research into these areas for various types of compounds uh, and that can stop fusion. Um, the more extreme case is when the compound can actually kind of rupture or make a hole in this membrane and really break it. Um, so, so it's an evolving landscape with a lot of mechanistic findings um, or with a lot of mis mechanistic possibilities. But what we think that, you know, to your simplistic uh, question is, is nothing but nothing simplistic at all. It's actually, you know, as I said, really excellent question. It really comes um, to the kind of the heart of this kind of research in terms of, you know, the mechanism and, and, and what context do things work and, and how do we define potency and so forth. Um, but it's really great well, point. And, and, Josh, in, in terms of what we all know way too much about, in terms of the membrane-bound proteins, yes. whether whether they're you know a spike protein that's used for receptor-mediated uh, attachment and, and fusion with the host cell or whatever, destabilizing that lipid envelope around those surface or those membrane-bound proteins can a destabilize the protein conformation themselves and break down that that process or you know kind of set set them loose or as we found in the work um, with ASF that p72 capsid protein we saw a very significant dose uh, dependent degradation of conformationally intact p72 um, protein so, yeah, I think it, it can have a lot of different uh, means of, of disrupting those critical early steps in viral infection. Yeah, may I can add one thing to that, Charlie? It's, it, thanks for reminding about the, the protein effects. So these virus membranes, you know, we talk about them lipid enveloped. Uh, that means lipid molecules are one type of kind of fat molecule in the virus particle membrane but also they still have very important proteins in this membrane too. And the proteins in the virus membrane depend on the lipids being happy. <laughs> so if you kind of make holes or you start damaging these lipids uh, in the envelope, also the proteins can kind of stop working um, so well. So we maybe can kind of tweak the structure of the protein by interfering with these lipids. And these proteins are important because in some cases they're necessary for binding to the cells in order to infect them, for example. So there's a lot of downstream effects, but you know, I guess even though the research sometimes sounds fancy, you know, essentially it's how many different ways can we break a, you know, break lipid membrane essentially? How many, how can we break stuff essentially? How many different ways can we do it? That's kind of the gist of it. Um, but what we see is there's, there's many possible ways. You know, as I said, you can kind of interfere with fusion, you can make holes in it. Um, as Charlie mentioned, there's kind of maybe downstream effects. If you affect the lipid envelope, you also affect the related proteins. So this is really kind of multifaceted. You know, what seems simple in terms of just breaking the virus in one sense uh, becomes, you know, quite um, more nuanced and complex very quickly. Um, but that's why we also see many interesting opportunities to also um, utilize it in various application contexts um, in, in more selective manners um, based on this nuanced understanding of what's going on and, you know, how we can utilize this for applications. So, for instance, well, two points to follow on that. One is a lot of these membrane disruptions happen in seconds. So Josh has some great uh, video in, in this artificial membrane, the supported lipid bilayer membrane, where you add the monoglyceride or, or fatty acid or whatever, and within milliseconds, you're seeing these membranes just blow up. You'll see tubule formation, you'll see bud formation, and then, and then they just blow apart. So really dramatic video of what happens literally within seconds. So very fast acting. Um, the second point, oh, is that, um, you know, knowing this about this class of compounds, and then I'll just turn it quickly to the work we recently published on flavonoids. We screened a library of close to 100 different flavonoids, which we believed could have the potential for um, anti-ASF activity or antiviral activity. And we found a number that uh, were 
had antiviral activity against ASF. We found five with um, significant activity that we explored a little deeper, and then one which uh, we you know, chose to pursue more deeply, and it basically had no virucidal or very little virucidal activity, but it did through various different studies to look at the timing of entry and the uh, timing of exit and, and various other means, found that it uh, actually worked inside the host cell and inhibited viral unpacking in the very earliest stages of viral replication in the host cell. So coupling some technologies that say had a high degree of virucidal activity with some other inhibition of say viral unpacking and replication, you know, could lead to some very robust types of antiviral, um, you know, mitigations. Go ahead, Scott. Well, I was just going to kind of drill down into how much do we know about a dose rate and, and where, where is the site of activity? Is, is it the plasma? Is it in the, the cytoplasm? And then how much do we know about, you know, what levels of titers we need to maintain? A follow-up question to that might be, you know, I'm, I'm assuming these uh, uh, short or medium chain fatty acids are being metabolized. And so how long, what's the duration we have to maintain some of these titers? There's just kind of a whole lot of questions in there. I know Charlie's laughing, but... <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're booked until, you know, eight o'clock tonight, right? I said three hours. We'd, be, we'd shut her down after three. You were not joking. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. So much there, Scott. Um, you know, we, we did some of the dose titration, at least in vitro. And we, we haven't done this. We haven't done any in vivo studies um, with ASF and pigs where we have some underway with PED and PERS in pigs, um, in which we hope to get at some of those dose titration kind of questions. Um, how much you need, you know, Josh has a friend that is a, a Russian mathematician who has modeled viral load and subsequent, um, you know, expression of disease. And um, you know, we've talked about uh, bringing him in and kind of modeling, okay, if we get this much uh, reduction in viral load, what's the implication for that? Or if we get this much, or, you know, and, and what's the timing of that and frequency of exposure, just all kinds of questions around this, which, you know, Josh could maybe take me under his wing and I'll do a second PhD or something, but... Um, More than welcome, yeah. anytime. You'd be the best <laughs> PhD student. Yeah. Um, so, boy, there's a lifetime of work in that in that question, yeah. Scott. Great question. Yeah. So maybe Josh. I can add a little bit to that. Like, uh, you know, Scott, you asked many excellent questions. And, you know, the the um, the simple answer is, you know, TBD, you know, yeah. to be determined all of this. Um, but I would say, you know, so far, you know, we, we have a very good understanding of kind of dose levels in terms of um, in vitro, meaning that we can understand what type of molar concentrations we need in order to see an activity and that's very correlated with between the engineering and the virology work and and also um we can really understand that in terms of even feed mitigation for example and now i think really the next frontier is really taking things you know into the animal and, and really understanding this um, in terms of more of the pharmacology um the the input dose versus what is actually the bioavailable amount of let's say gml in in, in the animal blood, let's say, or in, in various organs and, and so forth. I'm really understanding that the pharmacology of that a bit more. Um, this is really a new frontier for these kind of what we call antimicrobial lipids, whether it's uh, MCFA, which you might hear about sometimes, the medium chain fatty acids, whether it's GML. Um, there's been a wealth of studies done uh, in vitro uh, in, in you know, laboratory test tubes, a lot of great work in, in feed mitigation over the past few years, uh, but really that, that's the next frontier to really take it in animals to really correlate the dosing with what we see uh, in the animal. Um, even, you know, uh, retrospectively, you know, there's a lot to potentially learn from GMO has been used as a dietary supplement or food supplement for, for in, in humans for a long time. Um, there's, there's can be some learn from the dosing from those kind of cases in terms of what's the recommended dose and, and so forth. 
Um, but really, even whether it's for human applications, livestock applications, um, the, the pharmacology side of this is really a uh, huge potential and, and just it hasn't um, been achieved yet. I mean, it's really where the, the next level of studies need to go. Um, you know, as Charlie mentioned, uh, we, we have one collaboration at Cornell University um, for doing some of this work with, with some viruses in terms of looking at really dose response uh, in pig model and so forth. So I, I think, you know, a lot of this work will, will begin to become unraveled, um, but but really, you know, huge potential because right now we've seen certain initial applications in terms of like feed mitigation and so forth, where it's really pretty validated that it can work. Um, but really, in what context can this be used preventatively, uh, therapeutically in, in animals um, is really, I think, the next level of this. Charlie, is there anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, the, the other part of Scott's question about metabolism. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so what we know now and what is out there in the literature now is that uh, by feeding this monoglyceride, so, you know, it's one fatty acid hooked on to a glycerol molecule. Where it's hooked on matters. So um, if it's hooked on to the number two or the middle carbon of the glycerol backbone, it basically will be absorbed, transported to the liver, and esterified into triglyceride. But what they've found is that if it's at the one or three carbon, if the fatty acid is attached at the one or three carbon, then it will bypass transport for whatever reason to the liver and will circulate in, in you know, systemic circulation in the lymph and in the blood and, and whatnot. So, and it's a stereoisomer. So whether it's hooked to the one or the three doesn't matter. It, it's the same either way you flip it. Um, and so, you know, we, we did a, a really crude proof of concept study in sows to see if we could pick up GML in milk. So we fed the sows just a, a whacking huge dose equivalent to something like 20 pounds per ton of feed. Just brute force, could we get it into the milk? Uh, we did see about a seven fold increase in the amount of GML in milk over the baseline. We went back to a, a more like maintenance level, two kilos per ton, four and a half pounds per ton of feed. And we saw about a fourfold increase in GML over baseline. So it does get into uh, the milk. It does get into circulation. Um, could this confer some benefits to the piglet? We think so. There's some data out of uh, University of Iowa, uh, Peter Schlievert, I believe his name is, uh, who's done a lot of studies on human breast milk and found that human breast milk has about 400 times more GML than cow or sow's milk. And he believes, they believe that this confers some benefit to the babies in terms of antimicrobial, antiviral, and anti-inflammatory activity. So, you know, if we can translate some of that into um, livestock production practices um, and, and mitigate risks to these very most susceptible neonatal animals, then, you know, that's uh, that's uh, a good thing. Kind of building on that, Josh had mentioned that um, you know GML is being used currently in, in human nutrition. I guess you can probably go get it at GNC. So what what's the indication? Uh, why are people taking it? Go ahead, Josh. Oh, okay, the um, you know that's it's a great question. You know it, the general thing if you look at the product labels, you go to GN if you go drive over to GNC, you look for it. What you see is generally they say general immune support function. Um, <laughs> what does it mean? Honestly, I think it's a lot of the the, the question is is you know uh, hard to answer specifically. I think they people still need to understand. Uh, I've taken it before. I felt better. Why? I'm not exactly sure. But you know, it seems like something's happening. Uh, but I think really the the studies um, and, and going back to some of the earlier questions about the kind of immune cell interactions and so forth. And there's been a few science papers on this and so forth. Uh, they does have very good kind of anti-infective properties, anti-inflammatory properties, but really teasing out the, the molecular mechanisms, what's going on. Um, I, I think that there, there's a lot to be done. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, what what we know is from, from a human perspective, um, it's, it's safe to take. 
um, in terms of the supplement. It's, it's been used for several decades. Um, so it's safe. Um, from, from the animal studies, there has been some studies um, from Australia that Charlie mentioned earlier, where GMO has been used in, in feed studies, um, looking at growth performance and so forth, and had some positive effects. Um, also had some antibacterial effects, if I remember correctly, um, in terms of um, reducing some disease-causing pathogens. The exact name of the pathogen escapes me. Even I study virology, I can forget the name very easily. <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there's um, been some positive effects seen, and it, it appears safe to take as well. Um, now, there were, really, there were shifts going the in the microbiome, step. like away yeah, from the Clostridia species and, and that kind of thing. In the, exactly, in the and yeah. on a broad scale and, and reduced pathogen levels, um, yep. kind of increases in healthy bacteria at the same time. Um, so, so there's definitely positives there, but really, you know, still teasing out the molecular mechanisms and so forth, I think is really the next frontier of this kind of research. And, you know, Charlie kind of filled in the one study that I had forgotten about the kind of bioavailability that he had mentioned for some of these animal studies. But, you know, as Charlie's seen, there, there is, there can be very high levels of GML um, that, that, you know, enter the you know, animal milk and so forth that, that have been seen with some of these studies he's done. Um, so I think there's really, you know, potential there. And, and even in terms of metabolism, if you think about, well, what happens if GML um, becomes metabolized, for example, breaks down, you know, what is the breakdown product? How quickly does this occur in the body? Even one of the main metabolic products of uh, GML is also antimicrobial. It's called lauric acid. If you break it down, it breaks down into its fatty acid. Uh, we've even seen in, in our lab, in terms of biophysical, this chemistry findings that if you have a mixture of LA and GML, um, it can actually work better than GML by itself. So even when you think about this from kind of a metabolic perspective, if GML goes into the body, breaks down, let's say, 50% degradation, let's say, and then that, that ends up being like a 50% GML, 50% LA mixture, this might be even better. So, you know, I think it's it's really an exciting area where we just need to keep doing studies uh, and, you know, uh, just, you know, it takes investment, I guess. That's, you know, the one, one thing that, you know, animal studies are a big undertaking. Um, but, you know, as, as long as the momentum's there, uh, I see huge, you know, potential ahead. Hmm. So my next question kind of following up to that is one we kind of touched on a little bit during the webinar, which is, you know, COVID-19, we know that that is a, a lipid envelope uh, virus. Uh, we've all become many virologists during this whole, uh, <laughs> and I, I'm not excluded. And so we all know that the first week is kind of the, the viral phase, right? And before you, you enter in the second phase uh, where you have a cytokine storm and all that. So my, my question is, and that might be outside your, your area of expertise, but can we use GML during that uh, viral replication phase to maybe damp down uh, COVID. <laughs> I'll neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a better question is, do you know if anybody's looking into that? It would seem natural that they might. I, I don't know of any structured research programs that are there. They're, I would hope so. Um, I will say that uh, when I started running a fever last Thursday night and then got home on Friday, the first thing I did was took a good dose of GML, <laughs> tested positive that afternoon, slept Saturday, and, uh, you know, here I am. So, um, no, the uh, so there was a, a paper published, uh, and it, it wasn't directed towards GML or monoglycerides or fatty acids published just a few weeks ago in Italy, where they were looking at the metabolomics of healthy or currently infected, COVID-infected patients. And so what they were doing was taking samples of exhaled breath, collecting the condensate from that breath, and then putting it through a metabolomics screen. And it again, it wasn't targeted towards lipids or you know, peptides or, or, you know, any other class of, of particular metab metabolite, but rather looking at the whole spectrum. And they identified about 26 that could be possible markers, but when they narrowed it down, the two that most differentiated the healthy from the infected people was the presence of GML 
and monomerous state, so the C14 fatty acid hooked to a, a glycerol molecule, so the monoglycerol of, mono, of meristic acid. So those two monoglycerides were the ones that best distinguished healthy from infected patients. And those two could be picked up in much higher concentrations in the healthy patients than in the infected patients. So those authors hypothesized that it, it might in fact be that the GML and monomerostate had some, some sort of protective effect and might in future be used as a, um, you know, as a preventative uh, against COVID. Uh, and, and the only reason we knew that that paper got published was they ended, they actually cited our work from the African swine fever virus work as, you know, evidence of, you know, GML's uh, antiviral activity. So, it, you know, we just got an alert through the system that our paper had been cited and I went to look at it and came up with this stuff. So it's, I, th I think it could be a promising area, you know, for this and other future um, viral pandemics, epidemics. Yeah, so is the assumption then that the healthy people had higher levels to begin with and therefore did not become sick or perhaps the people that got sick, they're, somehow they're depleting their levels? Yeah, and, and they couldn't really tease that out from the data. Um, they kind of hypothesized that the healthy people, even though some of them had had, previously had COVID, at the time of sampling at least, they had higher levels of um of GML in their breath. To me, kind of the significance of that is that the GML was circulating in their mucosa in the respiratory tract and was there ready to be expelled in their breath. So to me, that, that, that gives credence to the idea that perhaps feeding this will allow for its circulation wherever to whatever mucosal tissue might you know, be the, the target of a virus, you know, exposure, and then help in that whole, you know, inflammatory, uh, antiviral kind of uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing to add too is, you know, from a product marketing claim, you know, of course you need to be careful to say, you know, that it's working uh, against COVID-19. Uh, I'm sure every supplement company that listened to this would love me to say that. Um, but, you know, th there's a lot of studies to substantiate that. But, you know, based on what Charlie's you know, seen in terms of what he mentioned, in, in terms of what's going on, um, in terms of the scientific literature and these associations between higher GML levels and, and reduced disease severity and, and so forth, I think there's huge potential there. But you can also think that this type of technology, uh, whether it extends to kind of human applications or to animal applications, it, it's really has huge potential because it's also um, targets lipid envelope viruses broadly. So we don't know exactly which virus will cause the next outbreak. And, and we don't know which population be affected. We don't know exactly which virus, but we'll have something that is potentially kind of a first line countermeasure that could be used um, for stopping the next pandemic as well. So I, I think that's one of the huge values for this is not only stopping what exists now, but also kind of preparing for the future. Mm -hmm. And, and because these mechanisms are so generic, you know, the, the membrane disruption is so generic and it's, it's um, based on purely physical chemical interactions rather than specifically targeting an enzyme or a, a protein or something like that, that that's why washing your hands with soap is still effective. It's so broadly generic membrane disruptive kind of activity. It's not like, okay, we're going to wash our hands with soap this year, but next year we have to go to ethyl alcohol, and the next year we have to go to chloroform, and the next year we have to go to, you know, soap is still really, really effective against viruses, bacteria. So we can, we can, I, this I think is, uh, you know, in a similar sense, applicable, uh, as Josh said, across viruses and and challenges that we might face and is not likely to raise, uh, you know, resistance types of uh, responses from those pathogens. 
Yeah, then this is really one other unique aspect of this is it kind of runs counter um, to kind of the traditional notion of how we develop antiviral compounds. Usually we call it kind of one bug, one drug, or one drug, one bug. We kind of focus on developing an antiviral for specifically one virus. But this kind of, we can span the thinking to kind of one drug or many viruses in the human sense or one compound, many viruses in more of a broader sense. Um, but really having, you know, one cl molecule, a class of molecules that can work broadly against many uh, important viruses uh, really is a kind of new thinking, a new paradigm in, in antiviral uh, science in, in general, whether it's for animal populations, human population, um, but, but it really has huge potential because it, it's really um, not only addressing things now, which is, is how the one drug, one bug kind of concept works, but really having compounds, having antiviral strategies that are potentially applicable to future challenges um, and having them ready from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So that's really um, intriguing. At one point you talked about this disruption of fusion and, and that to me would seem sort of putting on a very old hat related to resistance development might have precipitated the idea that you could see some resistance develop because you haven't really, um, it's not a cycle activity. You've changed the adhesion characteristics, but the virus is still surviving as it were. It just, so does that change the opportunity for resistance development? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so we, we just put out a review paper and had a reviewer ask similar question exactly. Uh, so it's a really good point. A lot of those early kind of fusion inhibitors, the, these kind of therapeutic drugs in the human space that stop the virus fusion, they were typically kind of peptides that bind to the viral proteins on the surface in order to prevent them from making certain changes that are necessary for fusion. Um, when you bind to the viral, pro when your, your target is a viral protein, uh, resistance can develop relatively easy compared to targeting viral lipids because these proteins are encoded in the viral genome, how they're produced, and, and it's more mutation prone. But by kind of evolution, the, the viral genome, when it's reproduced, um, it's, it, the errors can be introduced more easily, and this allows the virus to kind of escape uh, uh, new drugs being developed to stop it in some sense. With viral proteins, this, this can be a big issue, especially for, for certain classes of uh, classical peptides targeting them. Now, recent, more recently, though, the, the, there's other types of uh, fusion inhibitors, small molecules, and also things called lipidated peptides that associate with the membrane. Um, these compounds, they're either target the lipid envelope or they are so potent because they associate with the lipid envelope to bind to the uh, viral protein so potently that actually viral resistance is not such an issue with the latest classes of fusion inhibitors. Um, so especially the, the, the main reason is because the lipid envelope really cannot evolve resistance so easily because the lipids in this envelope, they're, they're not in the viral genome. So it's, it's a bit actually kind of um, maybe not so obvious at first glance, but the well, viral, viral the, lipids are from the host cell membranes. They're derived. Yeah. So they're not encoded in the viral genome. So the, the virus can't mutate to kind of stop it. Um, so, so this is an issue that has, you know, really many people have asked um, this kind of question, you know, fusion inhibitors, resistance yeah. development. Uh, you put it very nicely and it has been a big problem. But for the latest generation, uh, it appears less of a problem. Um, and, and really, we've gone through the literature recently, and, and it appears that fusion inhibitors are targeting this membrane. Um, to date, and to my knowledge, there's been really no clear evidence of resistance developing. Um, part of that you know, um, is just based on there haven't been so many long-term studies to do this. But even in the cases where they have kind of passaged the virus uh, in presence of drug for many cycles, you don't see resistance development. We need to keep um, testing that over longer periods of times. Um, once things start reaching clinical trials or and so forth, really seeing it in larger populations to really validate that. But based on all the evidence to date, which is growing and accumulating, uh, it looks very promising that resistance development at least has a very high barrier, if it's possible at all. Um, and I think that's one of the big potentials for the future. So it's, I think a really great point you mentioned. Uh, Charlie, does, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, I, I was just going to say for... Um, 
maybe broader understanding that as a virus um, particle replicates inside the host cell, then buds of that DNA or RNA will repackage and reassemble. And they basically exit the cell through the membrane, exit the host cell through the membrane, taking bits of that membrane with it. And that's what it's enveloped in, is the host cell's membrane. So that's why, um, you know, it's, it's very generic. It's not encoded in the, in the viral genome. So, you know, very generic. It's whatever host cell it came out of. That's kind of the constituents of its uh, membrane. So, again, very, very generic. And, and as Josh said, I think makes it easier to target. So, so having said that, um, what, what is protective of host cell membrane? from the activity of these uh, uh, fatty acids or the monoglyphs? So does that question make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had that question. I, I did a grad student symposium or seminar rather up at Cornell a, a month or two ago. And uh, a, a student asked that, well, you know, if this stuff just disrupts membranes, what about if you consume some and is it going to just start, you know, opening up all the cells of your, you know, your gut lining and disrupting all those membranes. And um, Josh may have a better biophysical explanation for why it doesn't. It could just be a dose um, response. I, I honestly don't know. Um, you know, as I, as I did point out, it has been through uh, GRASS certification. There's the whole dossier on the safety studies done as part of that grass certification with FDA. We have that portfolio of documents. We haven't, <laughs> I sure so, haven't read them all, but uh, go ahead, Josh. I can maybe add one more thing too. It's actually, a, you know, a re another really great question because people are wondering, you know, okay, as, as you mentioned, you know, how can it target the pathogen membranes and, and not human membranes or what is this balance and so forth? Um, one, you know, as Charlie mentioned, you know, it really kind of depends on, on the context of, you know, the, the dose and so forth, but also the me biochemical mechanisms of viral part membranes of virus particles versus human cell membranes are quite different in one key aspect, which is kind of repair mechanisms. Virus membrane, if it's damaged, there's no way to kind of repair the membrane. Uh, in human cells, there, there's a wide range of biochemical mechanisms, machinery, that can actually repair, uh, repair the membrane, even if it's slightly damaged, let's say. Uh, so actually what researchers have seen is that some of these membrane active compounds, um, they, they've studied the mechanism very deeply in terms of some of the small molecule antivirals, not, not so much for, for GML and so forth, but some small molecules. Um, they, they've seen how actually uh, virus membranes can be damaged but not repaired because the virus essentially is just a parasite. It's not a living cell. It has a very primitive um, structure in some sense. Um, but cells, mammalian cells, they're, they're quite sophisticated and, and they always you know, encounter some type of damage in, in just normal operation. Um, but they, they have quite... Stress or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I mean, oxidative stress and various types of you know, damage to, to their, their structures. Um, but they've evolved quite sophisticated machinery um, to, to also uh, repair membranes, um, lipid synthesis, uh, and, and lipid maintenance, and so forth. Um, so there's also a lot of discussion uh, about these mechanisms to also um, better understand um, you know, how these compounds can be used effectively against, say, viral membranes, lipid envelope viruses, and you know why they work so well um, against them, whereas they have relatively lower effects against uh, human cell membranes or mammalian cell membranes, more generally speaking. All right, Ken, what he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's but see, it's, still, it's still quite empirical too. I mean, even <laughs> with those kind of fancy talking, you know, as Charlie said too, you know, there's still empirically we see kind of concentration differences in terms of potency and so forth. So, you know, I can talk for, you know, three hours as, as Scott's hoping, you know, for all the detailed mechanisms, but at the same time, empirically, we see this um, and we just keep trying to understand the mechanisms behind it. But from an empirical perspective, it also looks very promising. <laughs> I am very curious about the uh, the lipid nanoparticle aspect of 
the delivery mechanism for mRNA, how that connects into this? So, so you know, really great question about the you know lipid nanoparticle technology in terms of just fatty acids, monoglycerides, incorporating them uh, can be really important. You know, a lot of the delivery aspects that you mentioned earlier. You know, one of the need for the future research. Um, so we, we've been discussing that a lot in terms of how nanoparticles can really uh, be useful for delivering these these compounds in terms of uh, making them uh, more biologically active even after they're kind of diluted in physiological medium. So, you know, once you kind of administer fatty acid or monoglyceride to an animal, you know, they, the concentration inherently becomes diluted as it enters the body. Um, but how can we maintain high activity even upon dilution? Uh, so I think this is another really huge area for the research in terms of nanoparticle technology and so forth. And you know, as you mentioned, you know, the vaccine delivery, mRNA delivery, and all these things, it, it's really kind of uh, the first example highlighting how much potential these kind of lipid nanoparticles have. Um, you know, it's one of it's probably the first example um, that really validates it in the public eye of why we need to do this type of research. Um, it, it, it builds on maybe 20, 30, 40 years of research in terms, in terms of lipid nanoparticles in general, but and they were used for cancer studies and so forth, but really on a broad impact and, and, and you know, COVID-19 vaccine delivery and so forth was the first example. Um, but in, in terms of agricultural potential and so forth, uh, you know, Charlie and I have discussed, you know, there, there's huge potential for these kind of areas in terms of delivery and so forth. Uh, so I think that also falls within the kind of the next frontier of what is possible. The actual nanoparticle technology has got, I would have thought, and sounds like a, you know it does some crossover to some of this discussion. And how else can we look at it in ways of delivering um, active molecules that we're interested in? And what should we be thinking about? So that was part of. Uh, Something that, you know, as I read about the construct of the COVID vaccine, I, I was struck by the, the fact that until the lipid nanoparticle was incorporated into that, we had really no way of putting the mRNA information in, into the host cell. So that, that was an intriguing aspect. I guess one other part of this was to, you know, and I'm back to um, the... I'm going to call it the non-discretionary disruption of lipid membrane. So I don't know if that's the right way to say it or not, but, but you know, we're in the choline business and, and phosphatidylcholine being such a key component of lipid membrane construction. And, and so it's kind of interesting, you know, do you want to be looking at things that actually help the host membrane preservation while letting the virus be or would you still or would that just have this sort of generic ability to support the membrane because the virus can't reconstruct to your point right yeah so exactly. it hasn't got the tools to do that but our host cells do so do we want to actually adjunct that repair if it, if that makes sense what i'm saying yeah at the same with something time. like choline as a yeah, yeah. donor for phosphatidylcholine. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the, the more we think about these questions from not only the effect, but, you know, as you're starting to get into kind of what are the mechanisms, how can we use, you know, nanoparticle technology or these type of compounds to kind of do it, we, the more we think about these things from kind of a physical perspective, you know, really kind of what, what's happening tangibly, uh, I think there's a huge number of applications like that that can begin to emerge and really, you know, the, the COVID-19, you know, vaccine kind of example you mentioned, I think it's a really... Um, kind of serves as a really important foundation to really motivate further studies for, for seeing lipids in a new, new light. So seeing the potential of lipid technologies and in, in many applications um, that maybe five years ago uh, would have been less interesting, but, you know, really seeing there, there, there is the potential there. We need to keep asking these questions. You know, we need mm. to keep doing the kind of molecular level understanding like, uh, you know, Charlie and I have been doing in, 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 in you know, some applications, um, but we can really, you know, keep growing that and, and really see, you know, many new opportunities. Yeah. So, sorry, Ken, speaking of three hours, uh, we're well over one, which means a couple things. Could mean we've got two hours to go, or it could mean that uh, our producers are going a little bit crazy right now. But um, I, I would ask this, though, um, is there any 
um, big topics uh, in the, in the uh, fertile ground that's gone unplowed so far. And it's, so I certainly want to make sure that we cover those. You know, I, I guess I would, I would say um, that just, you know, we started with kind of this, uh, there was some direction to it and exploring these medium chain fatty acids and monoglycerides. Uh, we've moved on to, to um, the flavonoids and found some promising things there. You know, we've, we've just commissioned a, another series of work with a different class of compounds. So, you know, continuing to explore and, and bring in those uh, different sources of, of whether it's these kind of generic mechanisms or more specific mechanisms, as we found with the flavonoid, where, um, you know, there, there are lots of more discoveries out there, and, and we hope to keep bringing some of those in, uh, doing what we can to, to understand them, publish that data, uh, you know, as, as openly as we can, and then, and then, you know, hopefully bring new solutions to the livestock markets. So, uh, this is this is really just a first chapter for us. Yeah. Nice wrap up, Charlie. And with that, we'll flicker the lights and call last call. And what I'd like to ask each of you guys is to give me, uh, you know, two key takeaways that our audience can take back to uh, uh, their their facilities, their customers, and uh, and and perhaps um, consider or start implementing. And Ken, why don't I start with you? You know, I, I'm not sure I have key takeaways, but a couple of things that come to mind as you ask the question. The first one probably is, man, there's still a lot to learn. And I'm a bit, <clears throat> I'm more than a bit intrigued about, you know, because this idea of using these fatty acids has been around a long time. But the tools, I guess, to understanding more about what we're seeing and what, why they're having some impact have been rapidly evolving. And so there's things, you know, that circulate from this conversation around whether or not uh, we, we didn't really talk about the, I'll call it the delivery mechanisms of these fatty acids. So what's involved with that? How does this help us if we start to, you know, look at some of those things? And will it make the potency of these things more effective? But at the same time, in our world of feed additives and nutrition, to be careful that we're not boxing ourselves uh, away from uh, the opportunity to use these things because suddenly we find ourselves being in a place of regulatory uh, uh, difficulty, I guess is the word I might use. So... It's a fine line, lots of discovery, lots of neat things. And, and yet um, I am curious how we uh, learn more and yet continue to have access to the tools as we go. Mm -hmm. Josh, appreciate uh, your participation today. You brought a lot of uh, very in interesting information. Uh, what kind of takeaways do you have for our audience? Yeah, you know, first of all, you know, thank you for, you know, including me today. And, um, you know, I think you know, one of the main takeaways that I would see in this is to really think about GML and, and fatty acids, monoglycerides, this kind of new classic compounds uh, or evolving, emerging classic compounds. You know, they've been well studied for a long time, um, but really to view them in a new light in terms of what we understand from the mechanisms, um, really they have potential to solve some of the major virus, bacterial challenges of our time uh, and potentially of the future. And so while kind of, you know, considering those kind of regulatory um, positions, as was just mentioned, but really viewing them as, you know, having huge potential for the future to stop future virus and, and bacteria challenges. Uh, you know, we don't know what issue will come up, you know, one year from now, five years from now. Um, but if it's a bacteria or viral pathogens, there's a good chance that it's a lipid enveloped one. And, you know, this is really, you know, an emerging tool that we can use to, um, to potentially stop them, I would say is number one. Uh, number two, take home point is really um, this type of research, it, it, it cannot come from my lab alone. You know, it cannot come from an animal science facility alone. It cannot come from a virology lab alone. Um, this is really kind of shows the power of 
doing work in the feed additive, nutrition research, agricultural research, more broadly speaking, um, by really creating multidisciplinary teams of, of researchers from around the world, whoever best fits this fits the need, um, but really shows the power of collaboration across traditional disciplines um, to really bring new insight to problems, um, potential solutions, and, and really drive innovation forward. Yeah, thank you, Josh. And Charlie, two things, and then also, can you tell the audience where they can find you and Natural Biologics? Yeah. Um, so I, I would definitely echo uh, Josh's last point. I mean, the cross-fertilization of ideas uh, between, say, Hovakim, the virologist, Jeff, the uh, Jeff, um, <laughs> Josh, the uh, you know the the biophysicist, and myself as a whatever physiologist, um, you know, has just been remarkable. And second point, I, I think, would be that as you look at um, solutions to livestock challenges like such as this, that be sure to work with people who, you know. A have the have the data that understand the mode of action that have well chemically characterized bio, bioactivity standardized um, types of, of products to bring these solutions because without that you know there's there's as we'll see at IPPE here in a couple of weeks you know there can there can be a lot of stuff that um, isn't backed up by much and so. Make sure you you you're working with a source that understands how and where and why and uh, the the products work before you begin to implement them in in your own system. And where can they find you? They can find me uh, at uh, our website would be the easiest place. So that's naturalbiologics.com, and uh, there's contact sheets and links to all of us and uh, links to our research bulletins, which are freely available. Um, all of the work that that we've published, uh, we've made the you know we've made the decision and paid the fees so that it's all open access so anybody can access at any time. Um, so again, it's we we try to make our our science an open book so that others can participate and learn from it and and hopefully help push the uh, the industry forward. All right. Well, thank you, Josh, Charlie, Ken. This has been uh, immensely entertaining and interesting, and there's no doubt in my mind we could have gone a full three hours. Um, and with that, you guys have a standing invitation to the exchange. So anytime you want to come back, you've got some new information, we're here for you. Uh, even awesome. if you don't have new information, Charlie, Josh, you guys can come on back. So I, I really thank you for the uh, uh, the, the great information today. I also want to thank our loyal listeners for stopping by. I hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Thank you to all the loyal listeners of the Real Science Exchange. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.